Amen. Well, um, I am excited as much as I'm excited to bring uh, the word to you when I have the opportunity to do so. I will not be preaching today, um, but this person who is going to be preaching is uh, really a, a mentor, a spiritual father uh, to myself, to my wife, Elise. Uh, Pastor Jim Critcher is uh, very, a man of unique gifts and experiences. He uh, is a professional music, he has a professional music background, so he was a, uh, a student of the world-renowned guitarist Christopher Parkinen. Uh, Pastor Jim was an instructor in college, a musical instructor. Um, he led worship. He pastored a church in North Carolina before coming to Grace Covenant Church. And um, he serves on our oversight team. So the group, the team that provides oversight to all of our Grace Covenant Church locations, uh, Pastor Jim serves on that team. And really, he has, uh, he functions as a prophet. Now, I'm not calling him Elijah. I'm not calling him Moses. That's not what I mean by a prophet. But in the New Testament, what we see is that God has given various people the ability to hear from him and to communicate on behalf of him. Not anything outside of Scripture, but in line with Scripture. But it's something contemporary. It's something for us here and now. That's one of the fivefold offices. You see that in Ephesians. There are pro pastors and teachers and evangelists and uh, prophets. And so um, Pastor Jim is, is a prophet. He speaks not only at Grace Covenant, but around every nation churches and even at the larger body of Christ, ministering, uh, encouraging, and, and speaking on behalf of God to his people. And we have the opportunity to hear from him today. Now, one of the cool things, uh, a lot of context, but I, I want to provide this for you all. Uh, one of the things that we've done uh, as a church, Grace Covenant, in all of our locations, is that he will preach a message for looking forward to the year 2024. And so he delivered that in Chantilly last week. He's going to uh, preach that this Sunday. And so I want to encourage you, part of the way that you hear the prophetic, and this is important right here, I'm a pastor, not not just by way of occupation, but by gifting, meaning my role is to kind of gently lead us as a people day by day. But a prophet has a different function. A prophet encourages, yes, but a prophet will also provide course correction. Now, the hope is that it's not an about turn course correction. It's just like a one degree, you know, adjustment, right? Um, if we're really hearing from God and in line with his spirit. But part of being a, a mature people of, of Jesus is being able to hear the prophetic and not evaluating what he's saying, but evaluating ourselves under the word of God. Amen. Asking God, God, what are you speaking to me? Yeah. What needs to be adjusted in my life? What needs, to, what needs some fine tuning? And when you hear with that, you can hear cl more clearly what God has to say. Amen? Yeah. Would you give a warm welcome to Pastor Jim Critcher as he comes? Well, good morning. good morning. I love Cap Hill. Love your pastor and his wife. You know, you can many times just tell what the grace and favor of God is on a people by the leaders that God gives that people. Hello? Amen. Now, if you, if, if you are in a, uh, a work environment or maybe in a larger governmental setting, that might send terror through your bones. I'm not sure. But in the context of this church, you must be pretty special. Amen? Amen? For God to have given you a pastor like Pastor Stephen and Elise. You could, that would be a good moment where you could just thank them for a moment. I love Pastor Stephen's introduction this morning because it saves me about two or three minutes of helping you understand how to hear what you are about to hear. Because there are many different people that will stand from this pulpit, and some will be pastoral, some will be teachers, some will be evangelists, and that will be their orientation. But then there are these moments that there will be these words that God is trying to speak prophetically, if you wish. And last year, I spoke two messages here about revival. In January, I spoke, I think it was the first part of the year, survival or revival, is that we were going to be living in one of two extremes. Now, I don't know about you, but 23 
was a pretty difficult year for me. Say, you can't say that. There's no positive confession in that. 23 was a pretty difficult year for me. And so living in this, if you wish, dissonance between the revival of God and yet kind of in a survival mode in a certain sense. Anybody else can relate to what I'm saying here? Yeah, I thought so. And then I spoke a second message entitled Running in the Rain. What does it look like for us to be a people of revival? And we begin to see, and we're seeing even yet still, we are seeing the beginning splashes of revival. I, I mentioned the, the Asbury revival, 1970, repeated in 23. At the end of this year, Auburn University, maybe some of you saw some pictures but there's hundreds of students being baptized. Folks literally pulling their cars up to shine headlights so that in this moment that students had to be baptized in this moment. Speaking with our campus director in Europe, my wife and I discipled this young woman. She says, I've never seen so many disciples made on the college campus as I saw in 2023. So we're seeing, we're seeing that which God is saying, we're seeing it performed in our midst. Amen? Amen? But in these messages, there was an admonition that I gave as to both our preparation and our expectation of what this revival might look like, both personally and corporately. Because if we look back and we look at a bit of church history or maybe you know, first and second great awakenings, and we begin to say, well, yeah, but there's still, our governments haven't been transformed. You know, the, the seven pillars or mountains of influence have not all been affected by this revival. Perhaps this is not how God's going to do it this time. And how many of you know that how we live our life is largely one of either met or unmet expectations? That's it right there. And so many times our, our crisis, whether it's relationally, whether it's with God, has to do with an unmet expectation. And when we begin to speak about revival, we've got to be very careful that we do not miss what God is doing because our expectations are not being perfectly met. Are we okay so far? A.W. Tozer, if you don't know that name, you should. Prophet pastor, teacher, said this, and I quote, Our mistake is that we want God to send revival on our terms. We want to get the power of God into our hands to call it to us that it may work for us in promoting the furthering of our kind of Christianity, unquote. A.W. Tozer can say things like no one else can say it. In the fall, the Holy Spirit came to me very, very clearly. Now, when God begins to speak, you want to hear words like blessing, love, more, double portion. There's almost a prophetic lexicon that you have to insert some of these into your prophetic proclamation. But He came to me very, very clearly. He said, Son... I'm bringing a sword. Now, of all the things that you really don't want, Pastor Mark, God to say to you, you don't want any sword involved in it. Let me tell you. And I begin to immediately push back on one, my own hearing, but secondly, then begin to push back on God a bit of, of what seemed to be so incongruous between revival and a sword. How do those two things work concurrently in concert with one another? And then in October 8th of this year, of course, we saw a, a, a new conflict emerge in Israel. We saw then the, 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 the trickle-down effect in, uh, 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 of the tensions in the Mideast. We're seeing even within the church now God bringing light on certain things in, a, in sort of a new and renewed way. And immediately when we hear that word sword in a church or a prophetic context, we immediately go to judgment. 
Now, let me say that I do believe there's a sort of judgment coming. All right? And we know from the Bible that it begins where, ladies and gentlemen? In the household of God. It's coming. It's coming into the nations as well. But I believe that what God was showing me is that it's much more nuanced than just judgment of what the sword of God really entails. Now, when we begin to hear words that entail God coming and bringing light, bringing division, bringing certain things with the sword that the sword brings, that it, 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 it evokes certain things in you and I. The first is fear. Oh, my God. And yet, how many of you know that Jesus has already taken our punishment? Are, are you with me here? But the sword concurrent with revival. How does that work? And God said, take a look at the book of Acts. I mean, let's look at what is arguably the first great revival. God pouring out His Holy Spirit. Signs, wonders, miracles, spiritual gifts being left behind. And yet, if you read through the book of Acts, not just as, if you wish, a historic account, but maybe even a prophetic template of what it looks like for people to live in revival. And yet, the challenges didn't go away. Peter and John, Peter preaching that amazing message there after the outpouring of the Spirit, this lame man being healed, what happens? They are immediately arrested. Drug before the religious authorities of the day to give account for what they just did. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 5. Imprisoned again. Released by an angel. Just read through it chapter by chapter. Acts the 6th chapter. All of a sudden now, the sword, the conflict coming that between the, 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 the Greek Jews and the Hebrew uh, widows, if you wish, this distribution of food, challenges coming from within, that this isn't right. This is where we now get deacons. This is how deacons should function in the church. And then we pick up the story of Saul's persecution of the church in Acts chapter 8. You keep reading through the book, James killed by Herod. And then from Acts 22 on through the end, we see Paul constantly in and out. You know, whether, I mean, this just judiciary and, 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 and this high priest, and until he finally gets to Rome, until we finally see a few centuries later where he himself is executed by Nero. Until finally we get to the 60s when... The church is dispersed in 70 A.D. where the temple is burned. And so what we see, even in the beginnings of the church, we see this amazing outpouring of God in the context of the sword coming from almost every place, if you wish. Not just from civil authorities, but from within as well. And this gospel, ladies and gentlemen, is the most powerful, divisive thing to ever be released into humanity. Let me just tell you. It's not the splitting of the atom. It's not what weapons man can create. It's not some ideology from the mind of man. This gospel is the most powerful and the most divisive force ever released on the planet. Jesus said this, Matthew the 10th chapter. These are red letter words, if you understand what that means. If your Bible has the words of Jesus in red, listen to this. Don't suppose I've come to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait a minute. What, what, this is in the Bible. Yeah. The, 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 the first gospel, Matthew, 
He's come to bring a sword. And listen to this. To turn a man against his father, a daughter, mother, daughter-in-law, all of these. Within the household, this separation and division coming. And then, if that's not enough, then he ramps it up. That anyone who loves these folks more than me is not worthy of me. This is not some insecure narcissist speaking here. This is God speaking to how we are to prioritize this relationship. And he will bring a sword to do it. Mm. He goes on and he says, anyone who doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Woo. I tell you, that's. That's some tough Bible right there. I mean, that, that's just a chewy part right there. Wow. And so here's Jesus himself saying, I didn't come to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring a sword. Then for you and me just coming out of Christmas, how do we reconcile that with the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9? For unto us. A child is given. You know this one. A son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. I can hear Mr. Handel's wonderful setting of this. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There we go. Watch this. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom Establishing, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. How then do we find these two realities in concert? Obviously, Isaiah, it was a messianic passage. He was talking about Jesus. And yet we find in Matthew, I didn't come to bring peace. And yet Isaiah says he would be the prince of peace. How do we deal with this? For one, we need to understand which kingdoms are being spoken of. Matthew is speaking of the kingdoms of this world, of this earth. Jesus himself said what? In this life you will have what? Tribulation. Why should we be shocked? <gasps> it's, it's, it's right there in the word. Amen? Amen? And yet, the kingdom spoken of by the prophet Isaiah is speaking of an eternal kingdom. That's the one that will always have peace and no end and Jesus ruling over. Amen? Amen. And I hate to be the one to tell you, but every civilization and every human government will come to a close everyone and you can look at the great civilizations of the past the most advanced in terms of thinking and technology they came to a close and i hate to tell you but as wonderful as you might think the one that you're living in might it might endure forever it won't it will not that's why we want to be sure that we are attaching ourselves our hope and our faith into the right kingdom because one has inherent in it peace the other has inherent in it a sword now stay with me here and so if we understand this that we understand that revival and the 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 movement of god to bring a sword can happen at the same time let me give you four things we'll talk about briefly this morning of how that sword works That sword not only is a sword of judgment, but it discerns, divides, decides, and delivers. And we'll talk about each one of those. The first is that sword comes to discern. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. The Word of God is living and what? Active. There it is. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, and nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. We know this. 
We see in the book of Acts, against the context of community, charity, power, signs, wonders, this couple coming up is time for tithes and offerings. Ananias and Sapphira. Had sold a piece of land and had agreed to tell the folk there, this is what we got for it. This is what we're giving. You know this story. Peter said, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Ananias struck dead. The young deacons come and drag his body out. Sapphira comes after him, not knowing what had happened to her husband. Same thing happens to her. You're talking about messing up a church service. Have people start dropping dead during tithes and offerings. Now, before you go back and say, I need, I need to give a little more this morning. I don't want to die. That's not what this is about. Because the story was not even about money. The story was about the intent of the heart. The story was in the midst of this outpouring of God trying to foist this deception and call it something it was not. God wasn't having it in this context. And what happened, it says, great fear gripped the church. I guess it did. And yet, look at what happened to the ministry. It says, the apostles continued to perform many miraculous signs and wonders, and more and more men and women believed and were added to their number. Amen. You see, Ananias and Sapphira could not discern between their soul and their spirit. And this becomes, in my mind, one of the great challenges in contemporary Christendom is being able to discern what is the soul and what is truly the spirit. Now stay with me. In 2005, a researcher went onto the college campus and began to ask some questions. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And out of this survey came a term that defined, if you wish, what this generation of people believed. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, that's a big term, but I'll unpack it. Moralistic, we believe that there's a system of right and wrong. Good. Therapeutic, it's about me. I want to feel good about this. And then deism will give you that there is a higher power, a God, if you wish. We just don't believe that he's intimately involved with my life. And so this defines moralistic, therapeutic deism where most people in the culture, and I would submit outside of the even college age, this is what most people, if you really get down to what their systematic theology is, this is it right here. But sadly, in a therapeutic world, which is basically make me feel better, this has had profound impact on the church. Is that rather than making disciples of Jesus Christ, embracing all that that entails, that our houses be in Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, where is the house you will build for me? Many times these desks, these pulpits, simply become a place of therapeutic direction. That if you will use this principle of God, if you will just do what God says, your life will be a lot better. You will feel better about yourself. Oh, my goodness. And if it feels bad, then it must not be God. I'll come back to that. And if it doesn't feel right, then if it's not of God, it must be of the devil, and I need to rebuke that. Here's the problem. There are a lot of good Christians spent a lot of time rebuking God, thinking it's the devil. Uh oh. Why? Because the process of conviction, oh, sanctification rarely feels right. It doesn't feel good for God to get up in your grill and say, No, you're wrong. And son, I love you, but one of us has got to change, and I don't change. We don't like that much, do we? And the, and the problem is we wonder why 
Sanctification and subsequent transformation sometimes seem so incredibly slow, subdued, and shallow. It's that we don't understand. Does God care? Yes. Every time you lose a hair in your hairbrush, God knows it. Every time a sparrow falls, he knows it. He's a good daddy, but good daddies will at some point hurt their children for a greater purpose. I didn't say harm. I said hurt. Amen? Amen. And yet, taking up our cross, dying to self, don't got much feel good attached. Wow. First Corinthians, Paul writing to that church says, We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand what God has given us. You've got to be empowered by God's spirit to freely understand and to, if you can't understand it, you can't apprehend it. But it's a spiritual encounter. Hear me. And many times we wonder, we, we see people. That even if, if they're in churches that, quote, are spirit-filled or charismatic or believe in all nine gifts of, of, the, of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's a little bit like saying, well, I'm good. Well, that's like saying that if you put your car, you can stand in the garage, it don't make you a car. It's how we live that out. Prayer. It's why many times our prayer becomes so arduous and so anemic because it's fueled by the soul rather than by the spirit. All we've got is working the list. I need, I need, I need. Do you realize it's old news to God? God has always known for every second of your life what you needed. Yes, he told us to ask. But I'll be real honest, it wasn't for his benefit. It's for yours. God's always known. Simeon, Anna, moved by the Spirit to pray. We wonder why our prayer life is so hard. We see prayer is a dimension of discerning between soul and spirit. Oh my goodness, what I want to pray and what God is prompting me to pray so many times, they're in conflict. God, don't make me ask for that. The church is a priestly function. 1 Peter chapter 2. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. But we need to understand that the priestly function of the church, of which you and I now are, is not a term of endearment. It's a job description. Leviticus chapter 10. In God ordaining the priesthood, setting up the priesthood, Aaron and his sons. And his sons didn't even survive the ordination service. But what did he say to them? He said, here is the role of the priest to distinguish between the holy and the common, the unclean and the clean, and teaching the Israelites what those things are. Wow. We find in Ezekiel him getting less than happy with priests. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They don't distinguish between the holy and the common, nor teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean. And yet the forces of liberal theology have many times come and not only affected but infected the church. And sometimes even under the guise of the Great Commission to make disciples because we're terrified that if we really do distinguish between clean and unclean, somebody's going to get upset and leave. If we really call out God's holy law in a way that's absolutely clear, And let me tell you, this is the slippery slope of where liberal theology begins to slip in among a people right here. There's a prophetic aspect to this, to this discernment of the sword. I've been really nice about this, but I'm done. Well, Pastor Jim, we never confused you for being nice. But we know from 1 Corinthians 14 that there is a principle that prophets judge prophecy. But I might add that that the, the prophetic, and by extension, the church that represents that prophetic is in great 
disrepute. Tremendous disrepute. Because there are free-range prophets out there saying things that simply aren't true. And this year, I might add, you're going to hear them come back out of the woodwork and begin to say some stuff that never came from the throne, uh, the throne of God. Amen. Jeremiah 23, and I don't have time to read it this morning, but God is bringing correction. And He's saying, these prophets are not speaking what I told them to speak. They're prophesying out of their own minds. Right. We need to be very careful how we hear in this moment. There's, there's a priestly dimension, there's a prophetic dimension, but there's also the person of revival. Because this revival, like every revival of history, will have a counterfeit attached to it. Some years ago, and I, I'll try to do this in innocuous enough terms that you can't put together what I'm talking about, but there was a move, it was centered around this young man, even some of the great uh, charismatic and apostolic fathers were declaring it the second Azusa Street. And there were miracles, there were signs, there were wonders, there was only one problem. This guy was in adultery with his girlfriend at the same time. And the thing blew to pieces. Gone. And let me tell you, there are going to be counterfeit revivals in this real revival. That's not something to be afraid of, it's just something to be aware of. And they both will have power. They'll have signs. They'll be wonders. But let me tell you, what will differentiate the two primarily? Tozer, again, quote, We still want to be in charge, shouting glory to God, but, mo but modestly accepting a share of the glory for ourselves, calling on God to send fire on our altars, completely ignoring the fact that they are ours and not God's. Listen to me. The man of revival will always be Jesus Christ. Amen. And if it's centered around a human name or a particular church, be suspect of it. Because that's not what I'm talking about. Man, i got to move quick here. It discerns. It divides. We know this gospel, this truth, it divides. We see stories. In other places of the world where someone in a household becomes a disciple of Jesus and the rest of their household not only disfellowships them, but wants them dead. Here in Western culture, we can come into salvation by giving a wink or raising a hand and putting it down quickly. But in other places in the world, this gospel divides. It divides. The same way that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 10. But we know that in this dividing, that God Himself is the one that divides. Matthew 25, speaking about the end of the age, it says, The Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, the nations gathered. What does it say? He will separate the people one from another as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And let me tell you, is that division is something that God does, we don't do. I want you to hear this. We are the ecclesia. We are called out to be sent out. And one of the great challenges of the church is that we highlight our differences in the wrong way. Not in a way many times that attracts people to the realities of this gospel. But many times what comes off of us is an air and an aroma of superiority of I have and you don't. This is never what this gospel was intended to communicate. It decides. The sword decides. On the field of conflict, whoever not just has the biggest sword but wields it the most skillfully is the one that decides the conflict. Hear me. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the sword of the Spirit as part of our spiritual weaponry, our spiritual warfare. But it begs the question, how do you and I use that sword? Sometimes we use it as some kind of mystical lightsaber. Zzz, 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 zzz. And we wonder why the mystical lightsaber doesn't work. Because the sword of the Spirit is intended to go along with a warfare of the Spirit. 
not just to get your will and whim done and call it spiritual warfare when you're pushed back against. Do you realize many times the circumstances and, and, and conditions around your life, they have nothing to do with the devil, but they have everything to do with the consequences of your behavior. The devil's got nothing to do with it. Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm chunky. I rebuke the spirit of gluttony as we roll up into Mickey D's one more time. You know what I'm talking about. I rebuke the spirit of poverty as we're buying another 65 inch for the basement. You know what I'm talking about. The devil's got nothing to do with that. And so as you're rolling up on that visa bill every month, rebuke on, baby. But I'm not sure it's the devil you're rebuking, but your own behavior. And God trying to use that to perfect something in you. Hear me. Is it really spiritual warfare? And one of the challenges that we see in the church many times is, shoom, here's a line. Don't cross it. This has been one of the great challenges, I believe, in Christian nationalism. Shoom. This, we start whacking off the ears of the very people that need to hear this gospel. Oh, my goodness. Jesus told Peter, have you lost your mind? Don't you realize all I've got to do is just, Father, let's have a Raiders of the Lost Ark moment here. And sending angels in and faces start to melt. I'm sorry, but it, was, it had to have been almost humorous if the, if the moment had not been so serious. We do the same thing. I've got to defend God. I've got to defend God's truth. Let me just tell you, God doesn't need your defense. He needs your deference. There's a big difference in the two things. Joshua, outside of Jericho, this angel shows up, sword drawn. What was, Jer what was Joshua's first question? Who are you for? Us or them? Red or blue? Right or wrong? The angel said, neither one, baby. I'm on God's side. And you see, this polarization many times, it's human. It's not divine. Mm, i got to move. I'm in trouble now. And lastly, this sword delivers. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. And I believe that this sword is also coming into your lives. To cut off and cut loose everything that has bound you up. And in some cases, for generations. Listen to me. And there is no chain, no rope, no bondage that can survive the movement of the sword of the Holy Spirit of God. None. In the Bible, we see seven swords, the last of which we see in the book of Revelation, and the sword coming out of the mouth of God himself. Let me tell you, that word cuts. It cuts away. It cuts off everything that is not of the Spirit. And how do we do that? John 8, that if you hold to my teaching, it says the truth will do what? Thank you very much. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't dead, he was alive, but he still had to be unbound to walk away from that grave. Some of you have been raised, but you've not been unbound. Two things that have to happen. Let me tell you, if you can't walk away from that grave, you certainly can't run the race that's been marked out for you. And it comes with a sword to cut all that stuff off of your life once and for all. And there are three keys to cooperating with the sword. The first is, a, is prevailing truth. Not available truth, prevailing truth. The truth shall set you free. What does that word prevail mean? It means superiority, strength, ascendancy. It's different. It means it's a truth above every other truth, including what's in your medical chart, including what's in your, in, in your credit report, including what has been firing off in your emotions. There is a prevailing truth that is higher than all of that. And then there's prayer and praise. 
Acts 16, Paul and Silas in the inner jail, chained up. You and I be screaming for our attorneys. <laughs> this is unfair, man. This is un this, this ain't right. They were praising, praying. Angel came. And he said, not only did their bonds come loose. Come on. Everybody's came loose. What might happen with a church operating in prevailing truth, prayer, and praise? Not just I got mine, but everybody else gets free at the same time. Amen. Amen. What have I said this morning? There's a sword in revival. They're not in conflict. We don't have to fear it. It's a sword that discerns between soul and spirit. It rightly divides. It decides who's bigger. And it delivers. Pray with me. Pastor, join me up here. Lord, let us hear something this morning. We can listen and say, well, that was another sermon. Or we can hear something from heaven Amen. that will change our lives. Amen. That will further not only encourage, but equip us for the days yet ahead. So, Lord, let us be hearers and doers by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.